<laughs> yeah, if you go and read LinkedIn's documentation, they have a whole bunch of stuff that they consider best practices. And probably 95% of it is just dead wrong. Like it is, if advertisers do this, they will fail or they will pay too much. And so what we've done, we've spent, I mean, it was probably, I spent about $30 million on the platform before the light finally turned on for me. And I went, ah, I get it. And since we've spent another hundred million and we've done so much testing and we know the platform so well, we know what it takes to actually get success and make things efficient. They started charging a lot of money from day one. So their prices have never been low and they really haven't given their ad platform a whole lot of love, like engineering and, and feature love, at least until probably the last you know couple of years. But LinkedIn's starting to catch up and it's getting really exciting. All right, we're in the Groundswell Studios, and today in the studio, the one, the only, AJ Wilcox. Welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks so much, Scott. Excited to be here. Awesome. Let's just just go right into, people are going to be quite surprised that I'm bringing on a LinkedIn ad expert to a show when I'm typically browbeating advertising. And you and I had a brief connection discussion, and I think let's start with a little bit of the dispelling the controversy about advertising. And especially for me, I just want to lead it off by saying, just to be clear, I actually think that advertising has its place. And when me and AJ had a little bit of a discussion, I'm like, yeah, we think a lot of the same things. I saw him speaking at... Uh, oh, Content Marketing Conference. Yeah, it's like the Content Marketing Conference. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this guy's brilliant. So thank you for being on the show. Tell us a little bit about your background. You're the top guy in LinkedIn advertising, as far as I could tell, and uh, what got you there? And then we'll dive into all the different nuances about what to do and not to do and our collective mindset around marketing and advertising. Well, I graduated from college about probably 13, 14 years ago with a marketing degree, and I happened to find digital marketing. I fell in love with SEO and just really loved the search side of things. And then at the last company I was with, you know, seven-ish, eight-ish years ago, they hired me. It was a B2B company. So I go and talk to my new boss, the CMO, and I laid out my whole marketing strategy. And I remember her saying, okay, all that sounds great. Go ahead and execute it. But just so you know, we started a pilot on LinkedIn ads about two weeks ago. So see what you can do with it. And of course, I didn't want to look like an idiot to my new boss. And so I saluted and said, yes, ma'am, Absolutely. And I walked out of her office and just jumped right into LinkedIn ads, trying to figure things out. And about two weeks later, I I wasn't really thinking anything of it. It was just one of my responsibilities. About two weeks later, one of my sales reps came up to me and said, hey, AJ, we don't know what you're doing over here, but we're fighting over your leads. Keep it up. (laughs) And I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went and looked in our CRM system at the leads he was talking about. And every single one of them without fail was sourced from LinkedIn ads, even though that was not the only channel I was running. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first hint. Long story short, I ended up growing that to become LinkedIn's largest spending account worldwide over the next two and a half years. And after that, ended up saying, this can't be the only company in the world who needs LinkedIn ads help. And so I started B2Linked and we're almost six years old now. We're an ad agency that just does LinkedIn ads. But I see you speaking and you you very much come off like an educator. So is that part of your business or is that something you just do as a service or as a facility to your business? (laughs) Yeah, it's a, it's my dirty little secret. When I went to go start this agency, I was incredibly good at running LinkedIn ads, incredibly not gifted at sales. So what I found is, you know, every time I would try to pitch like quote unquote pitch someone, I would lose the deal. It just, it wouldn't materialize. But what I found I was good at was breaking really complex concepts down simply and just providing value. And I realized that if I just shared value over and over and over, eventually people would say, wow, how do we get you to come and do that for us? And so because I suck at sales, just teaching and providing value for free uh, became my sales pitch. Clearly, you're, that's a strength. Like yeah, That's what you broke down things that I even I was just like, I find that sometimes LinkedIn you know, not to dive into the process of LinkedIn ads, but I find it a little bit confusing because it's so different from Facebook because Facebook, you just, it's so simple to be able to do little test A-B splits, but there's more money at stake and a different process with 
LinkedIn, although I'd really love to because of the targeting is really rich. So lots of things to talk about there. So first, before we go to that, that's incredible. You're like, you're building your business, you're doing it through education, but it's clear to me that you're doing something different in LinkedIn advertising. What is it? Yeah, if you go and read LinkedIn's documentation, they have a whole bunch of stuff that they consider best practices. And probably 95% of it is just dead wrong. Like it is, if advertisers do this, they will fail or they will pay too much. And so what we've done, we've spent, I mean, it was probably, I spent about $30 million on the platform before the light finally turned on for me. And I went, ah, I get it. And since we've spent another hundred million and- We've done so much testing and we know the platform so well, we know what it takes to actually get success and make things efficient. Everything LinkedIn builds is to pad their bottom line and not to be efficient for you as an advertiser. Although fundamentally, I very disagree with that philosophy. I think if you make, uh, just like what Google and Facebook did, they made their platform very inexpensive and gave advertisers a lot of tools so that they would go and be successful. And they went, you know, everyone who was trying it out went and told their friends and they grew the Facebook and and Google ads platforms from the ground up organically because it was working so well. LinkedIn, on the other hand, they started charging a lot of money from day one. So their prices have never been low and they really haven't given their ad platform a whole lot of love, like engineering and, and feature love, at least until probably the last, you know, couple years. So I I think that's really where they differ, but LinkedIn's starting to catch up and it's getting really exciting. Well, that's the one thing that caught my attention was your experimentation. And then you brought forward, you said, well, this isn't documented, but here's what I believe it to be. And let me just walk you through it. That's what I love because you're at heart, you're going, I, I believe that what you said, if anyone was listening, is that a lot of the next or sorry, the best practices or what's published practices they are not the best practices. I mean, they're, they're there to make you spend money. Yes. And uh, you've cracked the code a little bit and you showed the algorithm a little bit, what you believe it to be. And that's what I think is really interesting. And you're doing a service because you're not working for LinkedIn. You're looking for your clients. Yes. Right? Yep. And if you look at Google and Facebook, I, I mean, there are hundreds or even thousands of agencies who specialize just in each of those channels. That's a lot of marketers out writing content and teaching people When you look at LinkedIn, I don't think LinkedIn ads has been exciting enough for anyone else besides me and maybe like like a few others to try. And so because there's no one else out there doing the same experimentation and sharing, it means I've got to yell louder, I guess. (laughs) Well, and like so are you you're getting success, but sometimes there's this like thing in, in advertising, which is it's in the interest of the agency for you to spend more money on media because they make money on the margin of the media buy. Absolutely. Do you make money on the media buys? Uh, We do. And it's a model I've had a problem with for a long time. I mean, even back when I was in corporate and I was hiring agencies, I was just like, our motives are so not aligned here. I'm motivated by increasing efficiency. And yet the agency was constantly saying like, hey, we think you could spend more if you do this. And it just, it felt so disingenuous. So when I started the company, I was looking for any model I could run that wasn't charging based on a percentage of ad spend. And eventually I failed. I I couldn't find a, a model that worked too much better. But what I did find was if I set a minimum retainer, so our our minimum retainer is set at 2000 a month. And what that means is whether you spend $1 a month on ads or 10,000 a month on ads, we're the the same price. And so what I do is I, I tell people, Let's start at around 5K a month budget. Then when I tell you things look good, it's time to scale up. Can we go up to 10? You know that that's not me being disingenuous because I'm not making another dime off of you scaling that up. So I feel a lot better about making that recommendation when the client doesn't feel like it's me trying to pull one over on them and just pad my pocket. Oh, wow. That's great. You know, because I think that's that's one of the things I did with my agency back in the day was I would just went... I wanted them to know as agnostic. So I said, look, we're just going to do straight bill through. And most of my, you know, agency competitors, they thought that was a mistake, of course, because that's what they do. But what it led to was more trust with the client and enabled more initiatives and sort of getting a seat at the table. I wasn't a supplier, I was a partner. And I'm sure that's what your experience is because you're educating your clients and you're showing them how you're trying to beat the system to get more bang for their buck. Can you walk us through what that looks like? Yeah. I mean, we have two different offerings. 
the one that most take us up on is uh, it's like 90% of our business is managing people's accounts for them. So these are people usually responsible for a lot of different channels and just want someone who's going to take care of it and babysit it really closely. Then the other 10% are, are people who say, hey, we have the internal resources to run this channel. We just need someone to make sure that we're doing it right and help us be efficient. And so that comes down to my team does the account management but when you bring me in to consult or train or audit, uh, it is just me. I don't employ anyone else on that. The mm-hmm. goal is no matter what you need around LinkedIn ads, uh, we want to be the ones to uh, to help you with it. Okay, cool. So before anyone thinks this, this isn't meant to be a pitch about his business, but it's important because the way in which his agency functions is going to put some context in some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, right? Because I think that a lot of times... You know, know, understanding the model of the business makes a big difference in terms of what's the advice that you're getting. So you're giving all this great advice about how to build campaigns. When do you turn away clients? When do you say, hey, this isn't right for you right now or you're not in the right industry? Like, do you have that? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah. When I very first started the company, the only experience I had was running for one large B2B SaaS software brand. And so what I did just starting out, I set my prices really low. I set them as hourly because I wanted it, I wanted it to be easy to sell. And I would sell LinkedIn ads management to anyone who wanted to try it. Mm-hmm. And what that meant, you know, I had a 100% close rate for like the first three months because uh, I wasn't charging enough is what that turned out to be. But what I found out very quickly is what works and what doesn't work on LinkedIn because I was trying to take every kind of industry and every t- kind of account and company and... Once I figured it out, hey, here's the formula. This is what's going to work. This is what's not. Then I could actually start telling people with confidence, like, hey, I think you would be good. So in my mind, I've boiled it down to four different points where someone could potentially be disqualified. The very first is their audience. So if someone's audience is reachable on LinkedIn, but they're not reachable anywhere else, then they're a perfect candidate because when they start getting leads, their sales team is going to scream and just say, Yes, this is exactly who we want to be talking to. But if you've got an audience who you're saying it's like female between the ages of 25 and 45, man, LinkedIn's way too expensive for that. And so I would, you know, I realize people want to diversify, but I would go with other channels where you can reach them a lot cheaper, even something like radio and billboard, because LinkedIn's going to be really expensive to reach that audience. Second one is basically budget. What we found very early on is if people had a budget less than about 5,000 a month, they had a really high quit rate. And so we looked at that and said, why are people who are spending less than 5K leaving after a month or two? And why are people who are spending more than 5K, why do they stick around with us for a year plus? What we realized is that if you're spending too little, you're not seeing the results fast enough and you're probably going to give up on it or, or lose patience, assume it's not working. So we tell people, you know, if you're coming in with small budgets, feel free to do it yourself and, you know, be patient, but don't hire an agency like us because, you know, we're not going to be able to show you the value until you've spent for two, three months, then you actually have the data to, to analyze. Is that because you got to be testing, doing different, you know, AB splits and stuff like that or what? Yes, that as well as, you know, most of what we do is B2B. So we have these long sales cycles and, and large purchase decisions. So uh, if someone comes in and runs ads with us for a month and doesn't spend very much, the most that we'll get is like statistical significance around click-through rates, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you and I know click-through rate doesn't really tell you all that much. It might tell you what people want to click on more, but it doesn't tell you who's going to convert and what their lead quality is like. If you've spent about 5K, and it doesn't matter over what time period, but we like to do it over a month so we can just look at all of this data and analyze it. If you spend about 5K, you generally have enough leads to do three things. Number one, become statistically significant to your conversion rates, which is really helpful to know. It tells you what you can expect to pay like per lead. You also get to see the impact on the business. There's enough leads that you start to see what they do. And then number three, your sales team now has enough qualitative data about these prospects to make a judgment call and say, yeah, it sure seems like lead quality here feels high or feels low. And so it's really nice to get to that point of understanding the real impact. Okay. But I've got a whole host of questions already. So we'll let you finish the other two reasons you were saying that it shouldn't be for. 
Cool. All right. I'll, I'll try to rush through them because I'm, I'm excited for these questions too. Uh, the third one is basically lifetime value. Um, if you have a lifetime mm-hmm. value less than about you know, 10, 15 K of a customer, chances are LinkedIn ads are just going to be too expensive for you to really show a, the giant return on investment that most companies are looking for. And it, this is because LinkedIn ads are notoriously expensive. I mean, we've talked about this earlier on. It's an average of eight to $11 every time someone clicks on one of your ads, which is crazy when you consider that Facebook, you might be paying two to three for a, a business click. And because of that, when ads cost more up front, it means you've got to make more on the back end to, to get the same return. So I, I would start there. And then number four is really the content. Because we know that if we put an ad up that just says, here's what we do, click here to talk to our sales rep, no one has any incentive to click that ad and conversion rates drop to like one to 4%. So if we know that we're essentially like proposing marriage on the first date to customers and it's going to cost us 500 to a thousand dollars per lead, no one's going to keep paying that on a a long-term basis. And so we coach them towards hey, what if you came out with a really good lead magnet, a good piece of content that we can get to convert for $25 to $50? And then your sales team is going to be able to reach out to the people who've downloaded and then get 10 to 20% of them on a, a conversation where they can actually talk about sales. So it's the focus of you're not just trying to get people to your sales team. You actually have good content to share. Right on. And so one of the footnotes I want to say to everybody is um, on total lifetime value. I think it's episode 17, the master of total lifetime value wrote the book on it, Don Peppers. He completely does a deep dive on how to calculate it from multiple different ways. So maybe listen to that if you want to get, if you're listening going, I don't know how to calculate total lifetime value. Um, On the last point, I love that. That's interesting because what you're, this is, I think where you and I were talking before is I think a lot of people want to just put an offer up, buy or go away, right? And I think that in advertising overall, that has its limitations. But you're saying even more so for your acceptance is like having somebody that really understands building some foundational content of value. Because if you have that first, this would be a great place to accelerate that because the buy or go away, I, I would see that as being, I mean, I mean, I rarely even respond to ads that are say buy something here right now. But if it's yes. like an ebook or something, I'm I'm curious, especially if it's something specific that's going to help me with my job. If it's nothing to do with my job and it's something else, like I, on LinkedIn, it feels like it feel, I almost feel annoyed. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. And in fact, we've seen this repeatedly. We had a client who for three months, we kept working. They had four eBooks and we just kept working, trying to get people to download these eBooks. And the cheapest we could get them was a $127 per download. And Mm -hmm. I was certain this client is totally going to fire us because no one's willing to pay $127 for an eBook download. And then one day they came to us and they said, Hey, we have this new asset. See what you can do. It was, uh, I still remember, it was called the Ultimate Guide to Onboarding, and it was for HR decision makers at large companies. And man, overnight, I mean, conversion rates tripled, uh, our costs dropped in half, and we ended up with, with a cost per download that was like less than 27 bucks. And we weren't doing anything different. We, we didn't try different images between the two. Uh, We still wrote the ad copy the same. Nothing we did as an agency changed. It's just when you have a piece of content that actually is interesting, actually solves a real pain point for your customer, the wheels are greased. It just feels like a machine, like a lead generation machine. And when you try to give them something and force something on them that they're not actually interested in, it feels like pulling teeth to get your program running. So, so much revolves around going value first. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that, you know, with B2B marketing and, you know, when you're dealing with larger purchases and sometimes complex staging, like drip irrigation marketing, or you're not going to get that return. So how do you sell the patients? Because, okay, so they spent money on the ad, but the the download is what they're paying for is the download. They still don't have the the lead. All they have is an email, correct? Yeah, true. So yeah. they have to then convert those emails to a lead and have a process for that. And, and do you have that? Do you, is that something you consult to them as well? Or is it just the, the buying of the ads? 
Yeah. I mean, we, we've certainly tried. What we find is if you have a sales team who is just very set in their ways, they've only ever had search leads who are just people begging for demos. Like it's, it's a really hard switch over. So a lot of times we'll make this pitch and a sales team will just say, yeah, sorry, this just isn't for us. Then they'll take their licks for a little while because they realize that the old model of just asking cold traffic to do something really big and scary uh, just doesn't work. And mm -hmm. then uh, eventually they come back to us and go, okay, we, we understand content now. We're ready. So, I mean, I'll, I'll explain anything to anyone, but if, like I mentioned, I'm not a good sales guy, I'm never going to convince anyone of anything. So what I'll do is I'll just be ready for you as soon as you kind of turn that corner and figure out that's the way your team wants to go. Yeah. Come back when you figure it out. So yeah. how do you deal with multi-stakeholder sales? So say, for example, I'm doing a campaign. So let me, sorry, let me reframe that. I'm, I don't want to do a campaign on, on LinkedIn and it's a complicated product. I know that I need to get the buy-in from the engineer. Maybe it's the marketing department and the buyer. And they're, I know they're all on LinkedIn and I want to influence them. I want to be able to, have you done campaigns like that? Yes. I've got a cool strategy for this one. Okay. Um, I want to hear it. <laughs> what I like to do, I mean, if, if someone comes to us and they say we're venture funded, like let's go all out here, then absolutely. We, we, you know, start bigger, but usually we want to start with a more limited case and we're going to target the person who feels the pain that you solve. So sometimes that's, if it's software, it might be an individual contributor who's using the software that you would save them time or money or whatever you target them and get them into your, your sales process. And then what we do is take a list of all of the companies uh, who represent leads that haven't closed yet. We'll take those companies and we'll upload them into LinkedIn as what we call an ABM or an account-based marketing audience. And then we layer on someone from the finance department. And uh, if it's small companies, the CEO is sometimes involved in those decisions. Larger companies, maybe it's the person who feels the pain all the way up the chain of command. So if it's a marketer, we might get the manager all the way up through the CMO. And we're going to show them ads, not necessarily to get them to want to click, but it's really to get their attention. We want to stay top of mind. So as soon as they go into deliberation and discussion about platforms, we come top of mind because they've been seeing us everywhere. And using that strategy, it doesn't cost very much because you're talking to a relatively small group of people at, uh, at a small group of companies. So, I mean, it's not going to cost thousands of dollars. It might cost hundreds and you can pretty much ensure that around the deliberation table, your name is thought of favorably. So do you tell them to also create original content that matches like the CFO and so forth? Or is it like how, how like, because I mean, uh, sometimes a company wants so much resources, we can't make millions of different eBooks. How do you, yeah. how do you create something meaningful when you have multi-stakeholders? You have to make an eBook for the engineer, the CFO and the buyer, or how, like, how do you navigate that? Or tell me a little bit more. I think you can do that kind of customization down the road when you have the data. But I think just to start out with, you don't want to overcomplicate things just because you don't know if it's going to work. So if we have a piece of content, let's say it's an, an ebook or something for that individual contributor, we may try ads against the other stakeholders with the same piece of content, you know, pitching them the same ebook. And if that doesn't work, maybe we go with just a straight branding message that's like, hey, here's what we do. We make your life easy. I mean, whatever it is that's going to stick in their mind, but try whatever offers you have and when you find that something fails because it's not interesting, great, sub something else in or resort to just any kind of like, hey, here's an article. I mean, something to get on their, their radar. I think that LinkedIn, both with business to business sales, take longer time and to add on top of it, LinkedIn, like in terms of it as an ad platform, how do you sell them to really play the long game? Because you may not see the ROI right away like you would with like buying a sneaker. It's not, a, it's not as simple as that. Like it's not a impulsive decision. It's, it requires, like I said, multi-stakeholders and maybe it takes a little time for them to, you know, culminate. How do you, how do you help someone navigate then? Or how do you even go before that, go, this could be a long sales cycle and a longer campaign. Do you have a way of assessing that or helping somebody self-assess? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most of the time when we, at, when we ask our clients, like, what does your sales cycle look like? They'll oftentimes understate it, but most of them can tell you that like, yeah, it, it's long. And so what you do is you set these intermediary milestones in B2B. It's really easy to, to talk about like, 
MQLs, you know, marketing qualified leads, SQLs, sales qualified leads, and maybe proposal and close. So the expectation I'm setting with them from the beginning is, hey, these are content leads. So they're not all going to be MQLs immediately. So what we want to do is run for, let's say the first month, generate enough leads or opt-ins, and then let's watch during that month how many of them graduate to MQL. Does that look like it's a higher rate than other channels or lower? Okay, cool. Then we're going to run for another month and a whole bunch of those MQLs are going to graduate to SQL. And then we're going to say, what does the conversion rate from MQL to SQL look like? Is it good compared to other channels or bad? And if the team is sophisticated enough to actually track these things, without a doubt, they'll come back and say, wow, these LinkedIn ads are really high quality. You know, we know we're paying more per lead up front, but these are graduating through the funnel at much higher rates. So even if we're working with someone who doesn't know that stuff, that's the expectation I'm going to set with them is, hey, don't expect a deal tomorrow, but do expect to get conversations started and and then watch those conversations turn into into sales opportunities and uh, and watch all the way down. Don't just say it's a six month sales cycle, but we need revenue tomorrow. So LinkedIn, you better perform or we cut you. <laughs> so so in that case, you're baselining, right? You're going, hey, we've established what we think the conversion funnel is. Is that right? Absolutely. So if you've established one conversion funnel, I mean, you can borrow some of the information as a guide when you do another offer, another uh, ebook or something. How, in your experience, is that, is it totally vary by offer? You know, or is it, are there similarities or what's your experience? What we've found is LinkedIn ads are really good at getting someone to, like, uh, I'll, I'll use the analogy, getting a horse to water and getting them to take the first sip. Mm-hmm. But then after that is, I mean, it, it's the wild west. What we don't know without a lot of testing is, okay, after someone comes in and, and downloads your ebook, is the next best step to talk to sales or is it to watch a webinar or is it to get another ebook uh, or is it to have sales email twice and call once? We don't know any of that and, and we have to do a lot of testing. And what we found is, at least with the data set that we have, uh, every one of our clients are totally different and they have different cadences and different things that their audience is willing to do. So we like to start with a two-step funnel. The first step is get you to, to download content. And then immediately after, we're going to retarget you with a demo request. And if we just still, like after downloading our ebook, if you still are not going to sign up for a demo, then we know we need at least one more step in between. And then we'll, we'll try another piece of content. Okay, that's awesome. And, and But it still underscores the need for the business to go through a little bit of a build phase with content, landing site, processes on their end, because that's what I think trips people up is they go, well, we'll just do run some ads. But I'm like, you don't have any processes in place to receive those ads because you're just going to throw money away. Have you experienced that and ask people to go, look, you need to get this stuff organized first before you can spend money on ads? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, I I will. It's more common than, you, than people think probably, oh, right? Oh, it's super, super common. I mean, can't yeah. tell you of all the leads that come in, uh, I would say three quarters want to just they're oblivious to the whole content angle and they just want to push people right to a demo request or a sales Mm -hmm. conversation. And it's, it's really tough. We'll just, I'll I'll just straight turn people away and say, if you're not ready, like if your sales team doesn't know how to nurture and you're not willing to test something out, then it's best to go figure that out somewhere else and then come back to us when that system's in place. And, you know, it's not all altruistic on my part. Um, I really don't want to have a client that a month later, we have to have a hard conversation with them saying, this isn't working. I quit. I hate you. I would much rather turn someone away now, get them back later when they're going to have a much better experience. And then we'll keep a client for two, three years. So would you, would you advise them to go, look, once you got your system up, like actually just do it organically and just anchor organic first. And then once you've tested that, then you should add advertising? Or would you say, yeah, call me when you got your system down? <laughs> yeah, I love testing organic. It, this is a little challenging right now because LinkedIn right now is rife with agencies who will just basically spam people organically. So mm-hmm. I, I don't want to like praise them or anything, but people who do this right, the organic outreach to create relationships, to put the right people in your network 
have thoughtful conversations that will eventually turn into a sales conversation. Uh, I think this works great. And what happens is when, when you have boots on the ground, let's say sales reps uh, or the business owner, him or herself, actually talking to people, you'll find out what they respond to and what they don't. So then when you decide to automate the process, you, you go to put in like, like an email nurture sequence, you know what people liked. And so you can bake those things into your more scaled up nurture approach. And so I, I love it. I, I don't think that there's any, at least not a cheap substitute for doing it organically first before you start pouring accelerant on your content or your approach. Totally agree. It was doing high fives in there. So, you know, it's like, well, the other thing is, is that for you and for the, the business owner, they can't go, well, how much of that was organic we would have got anyways? It, it totally eliminates that because there's delta between the two. Yes. Yeah. And, and and it's not trackable. One thing we do see that's really cool, and, and this is, again, not trackable, but uh, it's palpable to the sales reps. When sales are doing outreach and having conversations and then we come in and start advertising, the tone of the conversation, and we're, we're targeting the same type of audience, the tone of their conversation starts to change. So they used to say to the sales reps, like, hey, why are you in my inbox? You know, like arms crossed, prove yourself kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And now after they've seen your ads for a, a month or two, they're saying, oh, I've heard of you guys before. You must be legit. Let's talk. And so the organic and the paid approach work so well hand in hand. That I just don't see them as competing, but both are very crucial and, and trackable in their own ways. Interesting. So, um, so what about if you did an ad that was about human connection? You're just basically straight up, not trying to do a demo, but having a conversation. Have you tried doing that? And has it been effective at all? Uh, yeah, we've tried a whole bunch of different approaches. And what I've found from LinkedIn, as opposed to something like Facebook, people, the audience tends to be a little bit more skeptical I think skeptical is probably a good word here. Yeah, so, that's the right word. Yeah. Wary. <laughs> exactly, wary. Very educated, um, discerning. So on Facebook, the same person could see an ad that's like, grow to a seven-figure business overnight and master these things and, and that kind of like bombastic language, and they'll convert. But if we reach them on LinkedIn and try to give them words that feel like they, they could be too good to be true, over-promising, then they're discerning and and they they won't convert at the same rate. So I think if you go after this approach of like, hey, let's be real, let's let's have a real conversation. I want to connect with you. I think it's difficult because they come back and go, oh, it's an ad. I know it's an ad. I know they're showing this to lots of people. The one approach that's different here, though, there is one ad format that they call sponsored messaging. And this is where you can actually send them. It's used to be called a sponsored in-mail. You send them a message that lands in their inbox and it's customized. It'll say like, hi, your, your name, and you can insert job title and company and, and, and try to make it a little bit more personal. And what we found is if we have an offer that's like a VIP kind of thing, like we want to invite you to a, an exclusive networking event with drinks and rubbing shoulders with others of your peers, this comes across really well like an invitation and it does feel special and they are willing to, to respond even if they're you know very, very busy, high up people who guard their, their personal information. So I just want to clarify a question. Is that, is that, not, is that different than in-mail? Uh, it is different because um, if you're sending in-mail, it's kind of a one-to-one. -one, uh, like you can buy in-mail or have – have a yeah, profile I, think I get like you I get like you know I don't know hundred or something. Yes, and <laughs> I've used it once or twice, and nobody ever responds, so I don't ever use my credits. So yeah, I think people tend to use them wrong. They, they again, they kind of go straight for the kill rather than like I want to have a relationship with you. No, um, no, I literally, yeah. I literally was actually quite kind. I wasn't. It was just that I just used it um, just to see what it would do, and I was like, hey, I just like to connect with you. I wasn't trying to sell anything, but. I find myself when I get them, I immediately go, oh, it's an email. I'm like, yep. oh, geez. So yep. it's like I am already have a predisposition to it. So I kind of figured maybe that was why my, my in-mails, when I did try using them, didn't work. Because I tried yeah. them when they were out of my network, when they're like third or something degree. Yeah. Probably what happened is they'd already been jaded by people who'd done it wrong. And then when you came and did it right, they were they'd already tuned you out, <laughs> which yeah. really sucks yeah, which for the marketers. Which kind of makes, it, makes that kind of a useless tool, but maybe somebody's mastered how to use it. I mean, uh, but I have enough, you know, network now that I never have to use that. So a quick other question. So 
What's the impact between doing an ad versus sponsoring a post? Oh, yeah. Uh, so they're really the same thing. You is, can. Are the results the same? Results are, I, I'll say, largely the same, but a little bit of nuance here. If you promote something that's already on your company page, what you're getting is the social proof that has already been built organically from the people liking and commenting because they follow your, your company's page. Mm-hmm. You get to promote that to a larger audience, and it already has this social proof that makes it feel a lot more legit and a lot more important. When you create an ad, you essentially, even if you said the same stuff that your organic company page post said, LinkedIn will treat it like a brand new entity because it is, and it'll reset all the social proof. So no likes, no comments, no shares. And I still prefer creating the ads directly um, simply for tracking purposes, because if I generate, uh, if I sponsor an existing company page post and a whole bunch of leads come in and go into the CRM and I'm tracking. I can't tell who came from the organic page post from an audience who is already following me and already has a predisposition to me or what I paid for. And it's very important to know what you paid for. So for Mm -hmm. tracking purposes, I like to create each ad individually so I can track it all the way to the sale. So would you then take the article, we'll say, say the post and then just duplicate it and make it into an ad just so you can you know, squeeze the juice of the organic and then be able to do a separate test on the, on the ad? Yep, exactly. Okay. And one thing I've always been really jealous of Facebook advertisers for, uh, you can get the best of both worlds on Facebook. You can run something organically and then bring in the ad ID, essentially the creative ID to create an ad from, and it pulls the social proof with it. So you can mm-hmm. get tracking all the way down the process and keep your social proof. I hope LinkedIn fixes that in the future because, boy, I'm jealous of that. Yeah, that, that's why, you know, because the sponsored posts, you get so much momentum. You pay lower rate when people have been social proofing it and so forth. What about articles? I've been really fond of, of publishing articles. And when people do it, that make it produce something really beautiful or, or really exceptional. I kind of find that being a really powerful tool that's underutilized that people don't understand. But that's kind of changed a bit because... It used to be when you published an article, it showed up on your the front of your feed. Now it's buried unless you're following. Yeah. You got to feature it. You have to force it to feature. Yeah. They, they just keep getting further and further away. It's funny. When they very first came out in 2014, everyone who was publishing went, wow, this is incredible. Every time I write a, an article, two push notifications end up going out to everyone mm-hmm. I'm connected to. This is amazing. My, my articles get tons of views and you know, all the growth hackers cared about them. Then people started complaining like, oh, there's too many push notifications. The same thing that's happening right now with with LinkedIn Lives. And so they started taking away push notifications and making them not as prominent that, you know, hey, Scott published an article. You should come and check this out. And they stopped sharing that as much in the news feed. So as of right now, I mean, if you want to go viral, the easiest way to do that is to write a post that makes people want to comment. And then this is a post from your personal page. If you write an article, you're really responsible for getting traffic to that article because LinkedIn's not going to do it for you anymore. They just keep, like you said, keep taking reasons away to get people to the article. I shifted off of it and started publishing in Medium. I get way bigger response. Yeah, totally. And one thing I really like is if you're publishing on Medium, you could take exactly the same thing word for word and paste it onto LinkedIn as well because Mm -hmm. both Medium and LinkedIn have you know, great SEO presence themselves. And so you don't have to worry about them taking like a duplicate content penalty from SEO. So I will say, go and write the post first on your own blog, wait for Google to come and index it and attribute your site as the owner, and then go and post the duplicate content on Medium and LinkedIn who have their own audiences and don't need the SEO juice. That's a great hack. Thank you. Make sure everybody's listening. Caught that one. I'm going to do a little slight change. Thank you. That's a, it's a really insightful because I, I, it's the hardest thing is keeping up with all the algorithm changes. Just when you feel like you nailed it or whatever, so forth. What about video? Like how, how does that play? And what's, what are you seeing in, in terms of that both organic and, and then, you know, using that for advertising? Yeah. Organically video was much like every other new product that LinkedIn comes out with. They really gave it a lot of play. So when you published video, uh, it would get a disproportionately large number of views. It was easier to go viral. And then as more and more people started adopting video on the platform, they they kind of took that away. So 
now it, it's basically uh, if you use video, it, it's treated the same way as an image, which is okay. I mean, it's still you can still go viral, but it's not amazing, amazing like it was before. Then they released live, and then live replaced it. So you know, right now they're giving more credence to people who go live and promoting their video content less. On the paid side, though, video from the very beginning has been kind of a lame duck, and it, it was just kind of really unfortunate. You had these video ads that they were crazy expensive, and there was no way to to get data or or nurture those who watched the video like there is on Facebook and YouTube. And just, I mean, as of the time of recording, just about two weeks ago, LinkedIn finally announced engagement retargeting. And now, if someone watches any amount of your video, if it's you know two seconds or twenty five percent, fifty percent, whatever, you can now put them in a retargeting audience and continue to nurture them. So. Now I'm changing my opinion on uh, on LinkedIn's video ads. Now that we can retarget and actually create sequences and, and funnels, uh, now I'm, I'm really bullish on it. I think they're going to do well. Yeah, I wonder if series would work better. So you do a snippet in the ad. So it's because sometimes like video, it's like a little bit long form where you're trying to get your point across and you got a very limited time and people are only watching the first little piece. But so if in production, you do a shorter amount, so you get your point across and then carry on the conversation, like part two, part three, part four, if that would have a better response. Do you oh, know what I mean? I like, love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and same rules apply to other social channels that they play muted just like they do on Facebook. And so it, it means that your storytelling has to be on point. Uh, certainly subtitles, like make sure you're, you have subtitles. So the 80% of people who don't watch with sound are still catching what, what you're doing, but you've got to hook them. You've got to have something uh, interesting to get their attention so that they'll want to pay attention for when you give them the second one in the sequence. What's the fine line though? Because you think of like the Buzzfeed or YouTube, the people have gone so overboard with this, like almost like over enthusiastic, knowing that it's exactly the first 30 seconds, you have to deliver this much to get your attention. But almost in a way, I'm naturally like turned off by it. Where on LinkedIn, it's it's a different, I think you're in a different state of mind. You want that level of professionalism. How do you balance that between really making that impact and still coming off as professional? Uh, it's a good question. And one that I don't think anyone using LinkedIn ads, at least no one that I've seen, has really mastered uh, because LinkedIn's not the network that people go and create a bunch of video content for. Mm -hmm. Generally, Facebook ads and YouTube ads are, are the ones calling the shots on creative. And then the LinkedIn team is just repurposing whatever they were given. But we very rarely will send any sort of traffic through LinkedIn ads to something where we're not capturing their, their information on a form. So mm -hmm. we're not going to like send them to a blog post and hope to retarget them later. And we're also not going to go to the other end of the spectrum and push them right to a demo from the beginning. So even if we have video content, the goal of the video is to convince them to uh, come attend this webinar or download this guide. So we're still measuring, even if even the video creative, we're still measuring it to how effective is it at getting someone to click and then take the next action. So maybe for me, it's like less emphasis on the creative per se and more on the strength of the offer in getting someone to actually want to engage. Right. And I would argue that probably, you know, if it's the right person brand, you know, that someone would be willing to listen in the right situation. If it's something that's unknown, you're using like, you know, actors, or you're trying to create something, then you really got to lean in on the creative and the offer, I guess. Eh? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think that's yeah. brilliant. You know, cause some people are just like, you want to listen to, like, I, I know that if, well, like, I mean, some people are, I mean, I've, I know Gary and Gary V, like some people are just like, you know, absolutely got to hear what everything he's got to say, yeah. you know, he's going to get natural pickup, but you know, but he's, he's just his own little beast. Uh, he's, he's definitely just got this like ecosystem of just like pumping out the content. I just don't know how long that can last for people's attention spans because no offense to Gary, if you're listening, cause I want to get you on the podcast and I'm in his 4d program, but some of the content just seems the same. And, and, it, I don't feel like I'm getting new content and I'm wondering also like with a lot of ads and content I see from people, it seems so repetitive and I get tired of it. Do you ever find that like, you know, the ads or the creative, you have to tell people like you got to come up with some new creative concepts, something new. I mean, you got to innovate because nothing makes me more exhausted about following people and stuff is when they say the same thing over again. 
Oh, totally agreed. And this is something we see a lot in, in advertising, especially social ads, where you see this saturation occur when your audience has now seen the same ad, the same offer, you know, two, three, four times. And, you know, by that point they say, well, if I wanted to click on it, I would have already clicked on it. So what we're watching over time, every time we launch an offer, we kind of set the clock on, okay, let's see how long this is going to last. And it's usually about every 27 to 33 days, we'll start to see the click-through rates uh, just start declining. We'll see you know, three, four, five days in a row of declining click-through rates. And that's when we know it's time to refresh your content. And if the client doesn't have like, let's say they worked really hard on some report or a guide, they don't have a new, a new guide to start showing people. What we'll do to kind of hack it a little bit is we'll change the imagery because when someone sees the same offer on an ad, but the image looks different, they don't perceive it as being the same and, and they'll go ahead and engage with it a, a second time or engage with it if they haven't engaged before. So we can kind of revive uh, that saturation by just making sure we're changing things up. But if we've run the same offer for, let's say, three months in a row, you know, really people feel the same way that you do. It's like, oh, I've seen the same thing before. This is uh, this is a rerun. Um, that's you know, you really do have to introduce a whole new offer. And ideally, you've learned from what worked before and you've now created content that is even more along the lines of what people want. It's a good little parlor trick to switch up the creative. But, uh, you know, I wonder if there's like, this is my theory. So this is me just shooting the shit. So <laughs> uh, my theory is, because this is how I feel. I just kind of go based on how I feel about things. And sometimes when someone overplays their ad, I go from like, oh yeah, like I'm, you know, whatever, I'm just going to ignore it. To then I turn on another side going, I never want to buy something from them. Yes. I literally get repelled by it. Yes. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> uh, I, I certainly like, do. And <laughs> this is something I had with Facebook ads for a long time. It was like, they wouldn't ever let you set a an upper limit on how often the same person could get hit with an ad. And so I, I think it becomes a reputation management concern when you're just hitting people mercilessly. Every time they they hit another page, they're seeing your ads and the same ads over and over. What we find on LinkedIn, though, it, it, we actually have a nice way around this. First of all, they have a very tight frequency cap. Um, by default, each person can only see an ad from your company once per day. So they're not being inundated. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, LinkedIn's not the network that you go and spend you know, hours a day on. And so because of that, even if someone sees your ad, the same ad, every single time they log in, if they're logging in once a week <laughs> or, you know, even if it's every few days, they're probably never going to feel so burned by you oversaturating them that they turn angry. <laughs> but what about retargeting? Because I feel like that, like the, just the retargeting industry, the whole process is browbeating somebody. It's like giving the same. Or do you switch up the, the creative on the retargeting so that it feels like it's a continuation? Uh, yeah, uh, this one, I really let the data dictate. Um Sometimes if, if we are retargeting someone because they made it to the landing page for a guide, but they didn't end up downloading it, the next step in the sequence is get them back. So show them the same, uh, get them to the same offer and try to sell them again on, on downloading it. If we see really low click-through rates, really low conversion rates there, then we know that piece of content just didn't work. And so then we're going to try something else. Um, but I think once someone has actually converted, they've, they've downloaded a guide of yours, now it really is up to you to show them a variety of things like, hey, you liked this, here's something else you might be interested in, or hey, maybe you should talk to sales because we've got a, a cool resource for you or you know something like that. I, I never want one of my audiences to feel browbeat. I want them to get enough uh, variety that they're not annoyed by the company and hate the client forever. Yeah. Well, that's good. You're thinking on behalf of the client too. Like I think some people just go fine. Yeah, we'll try it. And, you know, and they know that it won't work and they'll let the data, you know, prove it that, that, you know, that doesn't work or it does and they'll be happy to do it. I think it's, I think it's good to kind of balance between like preventing clients from doing stupid shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're in the home stretch here and I want to do a little bit of more uh, a directional focus on personalization and what's been your experience with in, uh, using personalization, how personalized can you do campaigns? Um, I, you know, I got to believe that having the amount of data that you have on in an individual, like by title, job, past jobs, 
the amount of personalization potential could be really interesting. What's your experience? Yeah, so there are two ads on LinkedIn that allow you to customize the the copy a little bit. The first is what I talked about earlier, the the sponsored messaging ads, where you can insert someone's name, their title, their industry, and their company name all dynamically. And if you do this wrong, it feels like a form letter. It feels, I don't know, just gross, like you're you're trying too hard. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you have an offer that really does feel like a personal invitation, then this can play really well. So that's really the limit of personalization on LinkedIn. The other ad format that can do this a little bit is called a dynamic ad, and it will stick your picture into the ad as the prospect, and you can insert someone's first name. I, th- I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so, it's not much personalization. It's just yeah. like, yeah, it's like table stakes. So what about, what about leveraging personalization in the campaign? So maybe in the ads you can't, what level of personalization could you glean from the targeting and do it on that end? Or can you, can you, is there any way of like, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out like how, how you can make a better user experience. So it was really being super relevant. Yes. I love the way you think Scott, the biggest trick we found here. Okay. So setting up the limitation, LinkedIn won't let you run any ad to an audience smaller than 300. So immediately, you know, that, For the personalization you want to do, you have to make sure that there's at least 300 people who share that characteristic. So what we, what we found is if we show an ad, uh, to all kinds of marketers at tech companies, we're going to see like a, like a 0.3 or a 0.4% click through rate. I mean, pretty terrible, like certainly less than a percent when we say, Hey, let's target just marketers at Salesforce. And then in our ad, we say something about Salesforce. We mentioned Salesforce. We know that we're going to get a click-through rate that's over 3%. It'll probably be three, four or 5%. And the only difference was that level of personalization. It's really clunky to try to make sure that you have at least 300 people in your audience who share a characteristic, but especially for targeting large companies with this account-based marketing approach where you can mention their company in an ad, it works beautifully. Like what would be an example of the copy that would be, hey, we know you're from Salesforce. Here's an ad. <laughs> what the fuck do you say? <laughs> yeah, that, that one's, uh, you got to be a little bit creative. And Okay. Uh, Give me what, an example of a creative that would like make sense because I'm, I'm trying to get my head around that one. Even if you just share news that's like Salesforce does, you, know, you mentioned something that they did in the industry. So it could be maybe more of like a, like a third party news approach. I'll, I'll share with you how to do it wrong. We tried one that was like, Hey, company employees, maybe it was like IBM or something, just calling out to them because our client had a, they were already on the approved vendors list and they could already use our client. So we were just telling them, Hey, this is a service that is available to you that the company will bless. And we ended up with getting a cease and desist. The client did the client got a cease and desist from, from this company's legal department saying, why are you using our likeness in your ads? And they went back and said, no, these are ads only targeting your company, which the legal department just didn't seem to understand. So be aware, if you do something like this, uh, you may end up getting a cease and desist from people who don't know how targeting works. Interesting. Yeah. Like that's, that, that would actually, I could see them raise alarm bells or going, Hey, we, we, we made you a preferred vendor, but we don't need now marketing to our internal group. You can see that as being, maybe you need to get blessing from the company in some way. Yeah, potentially. And the legal department, I don't think had a problem with the fact that they were advertising to their employees. They just didn't understand the fact that these ads were only being seen by their employees. They thought that, you know, they were advertising to everyone, but using the the name IBM or whatever. But say you're talking to IBM, you're mentioning them in the, in the ad, but you don't have a relationship with them. What, What would be the creative or what would be the approach with something like that? I think I would try a little bit more aggressive just to see if it works. One case study I saw, someone did something really interesting. They wanted to talk to one person in an organization, but of course with LinkedIn's targeting, we can't target just one person. We have to target 300. So let's say this person's name is John. They ran an ad to the entire company of 300 plus people saying, Hey, John in finance needs to see this. And so you know, you only have to show that oh ad. God, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's and what, great. So give me some other really rad examples of like <laughs> clever uses of ads in, in LinkedIn. Well, uh, th- I used to have a trick. 
through like LinkedIn's campaign manager, they've always had this limit. It actually used to be a, a thousand people in an audience. They've since lowered it to 300, but through the API, they didn't enforce the limit. So I used to use an API partner to build my campaigns, targeting an audience size of one. And I, I didn't know how soon they were going to patch the hole. So uh, I, I didn't like abuse it or anything, but it was fun just to know that I could target smaller audiences and you could actually run an ad uh, calling someone by name. Yeah, that's what I was trying to talk about is like doing a direct ad to an individual and that, you know, if you if you're to me, that would be amazing because if you could do a personal ebook going, hey, John, this ebook's just for you and you personalize it to the all the different you know clients and, and make that personalization. That's where I was thinking it could be really impactful. You yeah. Know I mean? uh, and Scott, I don't know if it was with you uh, in like pre-show chat a, a little while ago or if I was talking to a different friend about this, but someone that I was talking to came up with the idea of, Hey, what if you went and found a list of people whose name was John, and then you upload that list manually into LinkedIn as an audience. And then you start showing ads where you call the person's name, John, like, Hey, John, you got to check this out. Uh, was that you who came up with that? No, Do you remember? It wasn't, but I wish I did. That was actually that's pretty clever. That's interesting. And yeah. Oh man. There's like, so I got so many more questions and we're wrapping up on our hour here, but um, this has been great. Before we wrap up, what would you like to share with people that are listening about, you know, something to consider, whatever it is that you'd like to say about helping somebody that's really, because this show is about sustainable growth marketing and, and I want to help people with the tools, the concepts and the insights that help them do things that are sustainable. And, you know, obviously when you're doing, not when I say, obviously I gotta be careful with that word, but it sounds to me like when you're doing campaigns, you're you're demonstrating the ROI for clients, and that can be sustainable in itself. But is there anything you want to share that would really help someone go, look, you're really looking at scaling. Everybody wants growth. Here's some really, you know, some maybe some things to think about when it comes to LinkedIn advertising. Yeah, I think the thing I want to share is how when you run LinkedIn ads, they don't it doesn't have to be just a transactional relationship of I Put, I put money into this bucket and leads popped out. If you do it right, you can do this really cool micro segmenting of an audience and treat each one of them, each segment, like it's a private focus group that's just giving you data about who's inside. So I'll give you an example. If one of our clients came to us and said, our ideal customer is uh, marketing decision makers at companies with more than a thousand people we might go and create four separate audience buckets. One might be micro, uh, marketing managers, one marketing directors, another one marketing VPs, and the last one CMOs. And we're going to pay the same amount of money as if we just stuck them all in one bucket and we're lazy. But instead, we put them in four different buckets and launch the same two ads into each one. And now what happens is we get to watch the click-through rates of which level of seniority. Do they like what we say? Are they liking our content? We get to watch the conversion rates. Is this important enough to them to actually convert on? And we get to see things like impression volume. If you're targeting just CMOs, for instance, you know how big that audience is. By how many impressions they get per day, you can kind of start to get a gauge for uh, how many of these people use LinkedIn and how active they are on it. Mm. So I think my my guidance to you is if you are going to test LinkedIn ads, don't waste it and just try to get leads. Also use the LinkedIn's incredible targeting to break your audience up in ways that you're actually learning along the way. Well, what have you, what about doing ads to actually do a survey? So you're not actually, you're just, like, have you ever seen that where somebody's like, like click on the ad and, you know, so you're actually learning from the individual and you're getting them, you can, maybe you're creating an offer that allows that they'd be willing to, but have you tried anything like that? So LinkedIn just barely released polls uh, to us as users. They don't mm -hmm. have one that you can sponsor yet, but this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I I've got uh, I've got kind of a cool hack that I have in mind that I haven't had a, tr a chance to to try out yet. But LinkedIn has this objective that they call website visits, where if someone clicks anywhere on the ad, it doesn't charge you until they actually click on a link to your landing page. So mm -hmm. what I would really like to do is create an ad that is a poll where you're just asking people to uh, to contribute by commenting. So you say, comment down below and let us know A, B, C, or D, like what, what you would do here, or what you choose. 
and go ahead and link it to something else. Like you, you link it to, I don't know, your homepage or something, but your call to actions asking people to comment, not visit your homepage. And mm-hmm. I think you could probably go viral. I think you could probably get a lot of, of reach and surveys out of it without paying very much money at all. Interesting. So that you wouldn't be able to make it interactive. You just point out one, two, or three, please say in the comments. Yeah, I think that's the way yeah. I would approach it. Eventually, if LinkedIn ever comes out with like a polling ad format, I totally want to test that. I think it would be awesome. Not ad question is, is it true that if you put a link, um, if you're publishing a post and you put a link in the post, they impact you in a negative way and you're supposed to put it in the comments below the post? Yeah. So organically, that's been how it's been for a long time. Uh, if I post the same thing with a link and without, I know the one without a link is going to get 10 times the, the engagement and virality and the views. It's never been that way with advertising because if you're willing to pay LinkedIn's, you know, eight to 11 bucks a click, then they'll let you take the traffic wherever you want. Yeah. (laughs) But I'm hearing rumblings this last few weeks that it, it seems as if LinkedIn may have removed that, you know, quote unquote link penalty. We're seeing a lot of stuff that has links still doing well in, you know, viral wise. So maybe this is changing in the future or maybe it's just part of a test. Who knows? I hope it does because it's kind of a waste of effort. Like you see everybody posting, like click on the link below. It's below the, so now, now everybody's in on the hack and it just feels like, why not just let it ride? Exactly. (laughs) I mean, like, what are you afraid of? Like, like people are really, you're, it's going to be so bad that people are going to jump off, off the LinkedIn platform and you're going to lose so much, you know, money. Like I, you know, I have a hard time sometimes with the thinking of these platforms, but that's another story. (laughs) <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Yeah, right on. Well, dude, thank you so much. This is an incredible show. I'm so happy that we got the man, Mr. LinkedIn, on the show. And we had uh, just, and I feel like we could probably do another segment and even go deeper. But I uh, thank you so much for your uh, your time on the show. Where can people follow you? Yeah, I think LinkedIn's a great place. That's where I share all my best stuff. So uh, you can follow me, just type AJ Wilcox into the search bar and just look for a chubby ginger. So that's a, that's one way to find me. Um, if you do want to connect, just make sure you customize the invite and say, hey, I heard you on, on Groundswell, just so I know that I'm not going to be spammed. <laughs> so, and then the other thing is if you go to b2links.com, our, our website, if you fill out the form on any of those pages, you won't go to a sales rep. And you don't get put on our newsletter. It just goes directly to my inbox. And I think we've established I'm not a sales guy. So you can ask me anything you want. Right on. Thank you so much. And I noticed, by the way, you should go to his LinkedIn. And he's got tons of amazing content. And anywhere you can find him doing his teaching, and especially that, I think it was like two hours. Did you do it? Was it two hours at the content conference? Yeah, I, I think it might have even been two and a half. Yeah, uh, it, was, fuck, it was really, yeah. it was really, if you get a chance to listen to that, go watch that, that you'll know exactly why uh, I brought him on. Cause he just goes into such great detail and breaks it down so simply what a great episode and uh, on that video, but thank you again for being on the show, AJ. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Scott. Have me back anytime. Well, thanks everyone for being on another episode of the ground Store marketing podcast. If you have anything you'd like to share, go to groundswell.fm, scroll a little bit down. There's a little microphone there. Click on it. Tell me what you think, what you like, what you don't like. Rant, rave, whatever. Give me a Chewbacca noise. Like, I'd love for somebody to click on it, and I'll actually maybe even put you on the air. So until next time, guys, mahalo. Mahalo.